I want to take the title for you, but what I want you to do is to imagine standing in the middle of this completely straight road, uh, passing across a completely flat plane. Imagine you're actually there. Um, now, you will all say, I hope, that you would see the edges of the road as straight lines radiating from a point on the horizon. But what I want you to imagine is what happens to those edges of the road behind me. And I'm hoping that you would say, well, I would see, not even I would see, I would say that there are straight road edges converging at a point on the horizon behind me. So I'm going to try and kind of show you a model of spatial geometry in which parallels converge in front and behind at the horizon. Now, I'm not the first person to uh, consider these aspects of, of perceptual geometry. Um, I like uh, this particular Renaissance image partly because you see how important straight lines are to the structure of the image. These are straight lines through the, the diagonals, through the paving stones here. But I also like this image because you see Perugino grappling with this uh, foreshortening of depth in perspective. So the, the second group, you find that the depth of the figures is somewhat less than the, uh, it's, it's, it's compressed more than, than the size is reduced. And then the, the row of buildings. And finally, the two dimensional images of the mountains, which are just before a sort of, uh, sort of limit or boundary of representative depth. Yeah. Um, now, graphical perspective has been an inspiration to the, the theoretical position on. on um, on the geometry of space, partly because uh, it's the night sky again, partly because uh, in, a, in our perception of depth, of depth it seems to have an absolute boundary. We call it the, the celestial sphere. It's impossible really to even conceive of an experienced depth further than the celestial sphere. And also, we have something like that foreshortening where a spherical, objectively spherical object near that limit becomes just a flat disk. Maybe I'll have time later for another kind of But I'm just going to say a little bit more about uh, the, the mathematics of, of graphical perspective, just because it really has motivated uh, the, the field. So imagine this is my road extending into the distance, or perhaps a tape path. And uh, what you have to imagine is putting a large pane of glass on the ground front to. And, uh, and then uh, just imagine a ray of light emanating from a structure somewhere out there in the environment passing through the glass to my eye. Uh, the intersection of that ray of light with the glass is where the painter would paint that structure in the corresponding perspective picture. Um, so just a couple of things. Here, I've also shown you at the bottom uh, an object of distance, in this, in this case, the, the, the depth of, of three tiles, and the represented depth, the uh, S of, of well, we call this re, S of re, and then that limiting represented depth, which I'm calling the, and I'm just to connect it with the previous picture, those, those diagonals there. But similarly, of course, we could think of an objective span, in this case of our, of our road, and a representative span. And with a couple of similar triangles, you see two there and a couple more, you get this relationship, which I'm going to, which is kind of interesting and fundamental, which is the, the span relationship, I'm going to call it, the span relationship of graphical perspective. And again, it's got something perhaps to do with the geometry of spatial perception as well. Because, for example, if, if I have an, an object of size or span, say, C, as it moves past me, it seems to have a sort of size constancy, but as it moves into my far distance, it, uh, the perceived size seems to reduce in inverse proportion to the objective distance, which basically this formula uh, would predict. But actually, there are limitations to the applicability of this graphical perspective on a, on a flat plane. 
uh, as a model of spatial perception. And one of them is that in, in spatial perception, visual angle is generally preserved. But in the lateral aspect of this image, you could imagine at least that actually the visual angle will be distorted by, by a flat plane. So people have thought how you get around that. And one is to think of a spherical projection surface or hemispherical projection surface. Here is uh, one of uh, American psychologist James Gibson uh, that he called an optic array. And what you've got to imagine here is uh, this is where you have this mnemonic projection from the field underlying the, the bird in flight. And you imagine uh, rays of light from somewhere on the field to the eye of the bird who's at the center of the sphere. And the intersection uh, with the spherical glass. But two aspects of this uh, which I wanted to point out to you. One is that these linear furrows in the field are then mapped to these great circles or geodesics on this representational space, shortest path through, through that space. And also, I find it interesting at least uh, that some of what's represented here is not currently visible to the bird. It's kind of behind the bird. Um, now, uh, one would uh, perhaps think, oh, this is a wonderful model of three-dimensional perception. It's a three-dimensional diagram, but of course, it's actually really only a representation of the two-dimensional field. So this will preserve visual angle, but different objects that tend the same visual angle to the bird. It says nothing about how they would be perceived in depth. But just um, in homage to the bird in flight uh, for future diagrams, I'm going to use this aviation convention for, for coordinates um, <coughs> of the subject. Um, let me just go back. And also uh, the angles around the, those coordinates. So we would have, for example, roll, uh, pitch, and yaw around its y, z coordinates uh, respectively. So uh, in a seminal 1950s paper, Alberto Galinsky uh, thought, how can I reconcile this? Uh, span relationship and graphical perspective that I've shown you with something in which, uh, in which visual angle is preserved and came up with what's been called the perspective space model. Uh, where, um, so here, the, the subjective space is just basically superimposed on an objective plane. It's just a model of the plane, the way I've shown it there. Although you've got to imagine here that, uh, that you extend this reasonably easily to three dimensions rather than just two. Um, but uh, what you can probably see there with a couple more similar triangles is you would then also find that that representative depth ratio is also going to be the same. And so then we actually have a description of foreshortening of depth and, and maybe for the mathematician, it's even nicer to just take the derivative and say, well, this is our expression for foreshortening. And then perhaps we can even combine the span relationship I just showed you with the depth relationship into, this is going beyond what Galinsky did, by the way, but into, into a metric, okay? But, but just to explain a couple of things, I've just replaced that uh, circum circumferential span with the product of the distance and an angle of your here. And I've squared everything so that we can make things vaguely Pythagorean here. So we've kind of got a way to Pythagorean uh, equations where, so this is the foreshortening bits and this is the span uh, uh, relationship. Uh, so this is great. What's the problem? Well, the problem is that if we go back to the original motivation and we look at, this, at how we would represent objective straight lines in subjective space, they are nothing other than curves. Okay. It doesn't seem to work. So that was the introduction. I've already used a few minutes, but anyway. Um, so I'm going to suggest to you an alternative subjective space geometry that preserves visual angle. Here it is. Uh, so 
just to get your head around this, once again, here I'm just representing the objective plane. But I've now got to conceive of a sort of virtual three-dimensional space. I've created a, another sort of virtual dimension W here for this XY plane, in which both the objective plane but also a subjective hemisphere are both embedded. And the point of intersection, if you like, the pole of, of this hemisphere is the subject position. That's the, it's not it's not here, it's, it's there. Um, and at the uh, objective infinity will map uh, to this equator. So you have this sort of two dimensional experiential horizon here into the subjective space. Um, now, here's where I strain your conceptual muscles. But, so now, well, how are we going to think of uh, applying this to three dimensional spatial perception? Well, to the mathematician, that's very easy, right? So it, what we, we do is say, oh, we don't have a hemi subjective hemisphere. We have a subjective hemi three sphere, uh, which is basically the, the surface of a four ball. OK, but you can't picture that. Don't even try. But that's, that's basically, mathematically, it's trivial. Uh, but that's, so I'm going to show you these, these 2D diagrams, because that's all I can show you. But, but Conceptually, what I'm talking about is, is the formula. So, you, if you notice the previous relationship, the metric for this, oh, this is once again, I should have mentioned, it's once again a mnemonic projection uh, from the objective plane to the center of the unit. And that just gives you this metric, looks very, very similar. Once again, uh, this span relationship will, will also have that same sort of facility in describing the, the relationships in, uh, in perspective experience, in, in perceptual experience of space. And this, again, will be a, a description of foreshortening in that term. And it, for the mathematicians here, it's, it's actually uh, a nice way of describing this is exactly the same thing here that I just showed you, but, but uh, actually portrayed as a metric tensor. Um, uh, where the, those are the two weighting terms I showed you. And why these are zeros is just because I've chosen uh, a coordinate system where I have orthogonal coordinates here. But what's kind of nice is that's the subjective metric tensor, but then you also have the objective metric tensor. And we can do some hopefully cool maths between the two. This is to show you some things about representation. So, so why is this any better than Galinsky's model? Um, oh, one other slide. I, I only threw this in last night. Actually, for you, Camilla. Uh, because Camilla was talking uh, about, well, if you think that actually the objective arises from the, from the subjective, wouldn't it be nicer to choose a coordinate system uh, where you had some sort of yardstick, an increment of subjective depth you imagine sort of working out along your subjective space and then mapping that to the objective plane and then you'll get something that uh, you really have to call sort of length dilation with increasing objective distance. Um, so, uh, so why is this system any better? Well, you might look at this and say, oh, I've seen this image before. Well, you have. It's actually the same image as the bird in flight, but just remember that here the subject's down here, and here we've got this virtual third dimension. Okay. But once, but what's nice is that the objective straight lines now map to subjective geodesics or shortest paths through the subjective space. And I'm going to put down my one of my central claims is that the experience of straightness is because uh, we have a path which is a shortest path, a geodesic, through subjective space. Um, but of course, we've had to come up with different angles here. So this would be a, an azimuth on the, obviously the WY plane and the elevation angle. Um, but actually, uh, you, I didn't really go into it, but if you uh, looked at the Gibson's diagram, he also was showing what it was like for the bird to be moving forward, there to be a, an optic flow of information. I, I actually think 
he should have used this kind of coordinate system, which were that surely orthogonal on objective space, but but um, but actually non orthogonal on subjective space, uh, because you know, this is to describe linear motion. This is just I know, it's a cartoon image, but I think actually this picture should have looked more like this, uh, that vector field uh, of motion. So, am I going for time? Can I use five minutes? Oh, good. Well, that's what I've shown you so far. And uh, in the last five minutes, I want to talk to you about why. <coughs> why would subjective spatial geometry be anything like this? And for that, I need to you indulge me with a slight diversion. Okay. And the diversion is into some work I did just last year. You can look it up by Googling those two things, Duggan's self-rotation perception. Uh, a model of self-rotation perception. Seems like something completely different. But just indulge me for a moment. So here, you've got to imagine Alice, the blue figure here, that's her nose, uh, who's sitting in the middle of an optokinetic drum. So you've got to imagine this drum, her entire visual environment, is, is rotating at angular velocity rho clockwise here. And Alice gets this phenomenal experience of vection. So basically an illusory self-rotation, anti-clockwise, oh, you would say counterclockwise, I'm an American, counterclockwise. Um, uh, now also imagine here that we have Bob, he's not actually in the same optic medium drum, but we completely reproduce the, the, the uh, situation. The drum moves in the same way, but, but Bob rotates with the drum so that he has this illusory sense of being stable. Now, the reason for me creating all of this was actually to model some data that I, I don't have time to tell you about, but uh, which was uh, about distortions of the perception of simultaneity. Uh, but, uh, and for that, I needed to do these, what's called Lorentz transformation. So re remember, Bob was red and Alice was blue. So this shows spatio-temporal coordinates with time on the vertical axis for both Bob in, in red and Alice in blue. Some of the people in the audience will have seen something like this before. But what I want to talk to you about is this row was the ob objective angular velocity, whereas omega is the subjective angular velocity. And, uh, and on the diagram, that's a hyperbolic angle. And the omega is a sort of gradient uh, uh, of those red lines. And uh, in this Lorentz transformation, the relationship between the two of them is a hyperbolic tangent relationship. Now, I know I'm not explaining any of that. How does that help with what I really want to talk to you about, which is spatial perception? Well, uh, it gives us something like this. So this is the hyperbolic tangent relationship. And what I am proposing is this happens to be the relationship which transforms the probability distribution of, uh, of self-rotation, uh, of rotation to which I am exposed through natural immersion in the natural world into a subjective distribution which is uniform between these uh, these limits, these experiential horizons. Why? Because that actually will maximize the mutual information between the objective and the subjective. And I would I like to call this the efficient perception hypothesis. And I believe it perhaps is a general principle for how we might represent things uh, in our experience when our experience has finite limits, but we're representing something which is potentially infinite. So that's the bit that I want to take to my other theory, just to finish off. Um, and so, in what I showed you before, what I'm proposing is that why we have all of this, uh, this geometry is so that the, the probability distribution of, of events in my subjective hemisphere here is completely uniform. Uh, so here I'm, I'm you know, imagining a metric using a, a different coordinate system, this orthographic disk, but you can use the, those metric tensors to describe area elements on both the, uh, the objective plane and on the, the subjective 
hemisphere. And actually, from the determinants of those metric tensors, you can work out what is that optimal objective probability distribution of events for this geometry and the mnemonic projection, uh, well, for this to be the efficient perception. The reason for picking this metric is you can then at least show a, a sort of compression of this in the actual three dimensions where the formula would be much the same. This is, the, by the way, the, the volume of the subject with space V. And doing the math, this is the relationship that you would get. So once again, uh, if the model is correct, then this is the probability distribution of events in objective space uh, per unit volume uh, for which my model would be optimal. And it's, so in other words, this decays with the fourth power of the radius. Can finish up again. Um, the physicists will be saying that can't be true. This is, it should be an a, a inverse square law, but actually there's also a separate law, I won't explain it, Rico's law, which is a physiologic constraint. And combine the two, you should really get an inverse fourth power law. Um, so, conclusion. But actually, that's just the probability distribution with depth. What if the probability of events that I might experience is anisotropic? And just for example, we, we live on the surface of the Earth. Events at ground level are, like, are, are going to occur more uh, than events above us or below. So surely then we should have a, a, a distortion of the, of the hemisphere. Here I'm, I'm showing an XZ plane and a subjective hemispheroid. But the corollary of that is that then an object that's obtained, that, that subtends the same angle at my sort of zenith and at ground level, that subtends the same angle, an object near the experiential horizon should have a different subjective span, a smaller subjective span above relative to the ground level. That's actually the moon illusion. And, um, and final slide. So what's actually happening? How is this probability structure of the objective environment being manifested at a local level in my uh, subjective hemisphere or hemispheroid? Well, I'm going to give you what I hope is a provocative conclusion slide. Just as gravity is the curvature of objective space-time by mass, the tension, I propose, is the curvature of subjective space-time by infinite. Thank you.